interesting uh, moved around or something. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jonathan, and I am uh, I get the privilege each and every week to most each and every week to, to get up here and tell you about God and about God's relationship to us and the desire to be with us. And most weeks, um, I, I, I feel inadequate, um, and, and this week is no different. I, as we've been talking about, for those of you who don't know, we're, we're in this series called Finding God, and it's this idea that, that so often God seems to be far away, that God seems to be distant, that, that somewhere out there is God and He's not close to us. And that's not true at all. In fact, the truth of the matter is that God is always near, but when God seems distant, it, it, distant it's because we put Him at arm's length. And, and I feel inadequate because I find myself doing that so often, that, that I kind of stiff arm God like I want Him to stay back so that I can do what I need to do. And we've been talking about the parable of the prodigal son. You guys, most of you have heard that. Uh, the parable of the prodigal son is about this, this younger son. It's about two sons and a father, but it's about, we've been talking about the younger son, and this younger son had this longing for something more, like there's got to be more than this. Like this life that I'm living, there's got to be more to it than this. And so the, 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 the son, the younger son goes out and he goes chasing and he, and he finds himself involved in, with prostitutes and, and living his life recklessly and spending his inheritance and, and wasting all that away. And, 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 and I feel myself so often put God at arm's length like that. And so, and so as, I, as I come into this today, I kind of feel like that, that, that I'm almost not even the right person to be talking about this. But, but the younger son put God at arm's length. He wanted to go his own way. And, and what he realized is that when he lived his life this way, that, that he found himself in the, in the pigsty. And he found himself longing to eat what the pigs ate. And, 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 and this is a parable. This is a, a, a pretend story that Jesus told uh, that, that kind of highlighted what life is like when we have these longings. And last week we talked about not only this longing, but his regret when he found himself uh, with the pigs. And he, he realized that what he had done and the consequences of what he had done led him to this place where he regretted the decisions that he had made. And today we're going to continue on as we, we talk about that uh, as he looks forward, what's going to be happening next. And because of his bad decisions, this young son, this younger brother, this young son was lost. And as Christians, we use that word a lot. Or if you're a Bible reader, you find that word a lot in the New Testament, the word lost. And, and, and sometimes in Christian circles, it almost becomes like this bad word, like, like he's so lost or she's, she's lost. I remember working with a, a guy who, who, when he was talking about somebody who uh, didn't have any common sense, he would say that that person's like a, a lost ball in high weeds. I don't know if you ever heard that or not. Um, he was from the country, so that's where he got that. He probably knew a lot of lost balls in high weeds. But, but we kind of lose the idea of what lostness actually is. But we're, today we're going to talk about kind of a, a little bit about what it means to actually be lost in a spiritual sense. And Dean mentioned that God desires to be with us. God desires to be in a relationship with us. And when we stiff arm God, when we push God away, when we push God uh, to the perimeter and the periphery of our life, then, then what we're doing is actually severing that relationship that God desires for us. And it makes us lost. And I don't know if, if you can feel the weight of that word, the weight of what that means. To be lost means to not have a relationship with God. And I think too often Christians in churches, they don't, they don't think about that enough. I don't know how many of you, you know, have thought about this, but how often do we, do we think about lost people? How often do we pray for lost people? I mean, if we were to go around and say, you know, what, what are your prayer concerns? I don't know that if we went through here, we would talk about everybody's hurts and, and, and their, their, their pains and their struggles and even maybe their relationship, but probably most of our prayer concerns would be health related. How long before we got to, let's pray for somebody who's lost? I think we, we miss what that word actually means. An eternal separation from, from that individual and God ultimately is what it means to be lost. Yesterday I was listening to a, a sermon as I was mowing the yard and, and the guy was talking about a church in their town um, had their AC unit stolen. And, and on their church sign they said, to whoever stole our AC units, keep them. You're going to need them where you're going. <laughs> and we laugh at that, right? But, but think about that. The church almost sounds excited that that person is lost. I mean, do we really care for lost people? 
Well, as the younger son realizes the situation and he regrets what happened, he, he'd squandered all of his inheritance chasing this, this reckless lifestyle and living his life, and now he, he was without anything. And, and I always wonder, you know, it's, it's a, it's a made-up story, so I'm just speculating, but I always wonder, what is he thinking as he begins to, to, to think about what's going to happen next? And, and what actually happened was he got to the point in the story where he recognized his conditions, he came to his senses, and he decided, I want to go home. I want to go home. Have you ever been homesick? I get homesick really easy. I'm a home person. I love being at home. I, 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 I'm a, I like being around my family, so I want to be at home. So anytime I'm gone, it's not long before I want to be, I want to be back home. Um, a, a couple years ago now, we went to Honduras on a mission trip. We're gone for 10 days. After about six, I was like, I can't take it anymore. I've got to get home. I, I love being at home. I, I, I want to be there. I remember the, probably the, the biggest time of my life where I was the most homesick was a time that I spent at a church camp. And I remember going to this camp, and I, and I can't remember where it was. In fact, I asked my mom, and she couldn't remember either. And, and so, because we've lived in lots of different places, I, I have a hard time remembering, you know, where did I experience these things. And, and so I was at this church camp, and it was, it was a good time. They had, you know, the, the zip line, and they had... Uh, you know, things to play and games and all this stuff. They had a Jeep ride. It was, it was all a good time. But at night, when it was quiet and I was, you know, in bed trying to go to sleep, all I could think about was, I want to be home. I asked my brother about it because I asked my mom, I said, do you remember where that was? And, and she's like, no, I don't even think that happened. So maybe <laughs> I'm making this up in my mind. It, it seems really real. If it's not real, it seems real. I don't know. But, but I asked my brother too, and he said he didn't remember anything about it either. So, but one of the things I remember, and this has nothing to do with being homesick, but one of the things I remember is they would have this campfire at night, you know. And, and um, one day the, this guy that was a young guy talking about the evils of rock music. And so all the kids popped open their cassette players and they threw their ACDC tapes into the campfire. Um, that doesn't have anything to do with anything. But... Uh, so I, so I kind of, because of that and because of my thoughts on being homesick and stuff, I, I, don't, um, I don't enjoy those kind of things. Um, that's not to say for those of you who are thinking about going to Woodland Camp, please sign up. Aaron's going to take you. You're going to have a great time. Um, that's just me personally. I, I, I get homesick easily. Well, well the, the, the younger son, he experienced this, this kind of, I want to go home, not because he was homesick, but because he realized, he recognized this situation, that, he had, that because of his decisions, he was in this situation where he needed to do something. It was time to go back. And that's going to happen to us as well. When you experience this deep regret, you have this longing where you want to go do something and it, it leads you to this deep regret that leads to repentance that we talked about last week. It can, it can cause you to recognize your need for help. And that's what we're going to talk about today. About this need for help. But it has to be you. It can't be somebody else deciding that you need help or that you need to do this. You, and, and also, you can't get better on your own. This is another big one that we're going to talk about as well. You can't get better on your own. If you're ever in the place of this younger son where you feel like God's at a distance, you must recognize your own personal need for help. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Luke chapter 15. This is the, the parable of the prodigal son that we've been talking about for the last, this is the third week now. This is part three of five. Uh, so we're going to begin by reading. If you don't have a Bible, by the way, if you don't have a Bible, grab one of those in the pew in front of you. And if you don't own a Bible or if you don't own a, a current translation of the Bible, feel free to take one of those home with you today as a gift from Snellville Christian Church. Nobody's going to tackle you, um, I, I don't think. They're not supposed to if they do. So, so remember, the younger son had, had gone off longing for something more, for something better out there and all this stuff. And then he, he had squandered all his inheritance, all his wealth on on reckless living, the Bible calls it, and we find out later with prostitutes and doing other things like this. He, and he'd spent everything, and a severe famine comes up, and he, and he gets hungry, and he's longing, he's feeding pigs now, and he's longing for what the pigs have to eat. Let's look at the very first part of Luke chapter 15, verse 20. It says this, And he arose and came to his father. So there's this point where, in this young man's life, where he realizes that my life is such a mess, I don't know what to do, but what I'm going to do is I have decided that I'm going to go back home. I'm going to return to my father. He arose and came to his father. Now, unlike me, when I was at camp, or at least allegedly at camp, 
He was able to decide what he wanted to do and what was going to happen. I wasn't able to do that. I was probably 10 years old. I couldn't drive. I couldn't make those things happen. But he decided, he made a decision that I need help. I'm going home. I'd blown it. I've lost everything that I have. Uh, he was hungry. There was a famine. He probably lost all kinds of weight. Maybe he didn't even look the same. But he decided, I'm going back home. And I'm going back home to my father. And for some of you, this sounds kind of ridiculous. Especially going back to your father. Can you imagine? Some of you were probably thinking, I can't imagine going back to my father after squandering all this money, doing all of this reckless stuff, uh, making all of these terribly poor decisions. I can't imagine going back to my father. My father would laugh at me or ridicule me or, or yell at me and tell me to get out. He's no, I'm no longer his son or whatever. Some of you think that way because some of you have a father like that. I was fortunate enough growing up, and I'm fortunate enough now to have a, a wonderful dad. A dad who loves me tremendously, a, a, a dad who's not perfect by any means, but one that I know for sure loves me. And if there was a situation where, where I, would, I had messed up and I had done all of these awful, terrible things and, and I needed to go back, I know without a doubt that my father would welcome me. And I know a lot of you aren't in that place. That doesn't mean that he wouldn't uh, give me some heavy advice or maybe some tough love, but I know that my father would love me. And if you can't imagine your father being like this, if you can't imagine being in a situation where, where you would be willing to run to your father, then I want you to try to imagine, not what you think your father would do, but try to imagine what a good father, how a good father would respond. Try to imagine a loving father like this. And I think this younger son must have realized and, knew, and known that his father would, would be loving. But I still wonder about his thoughts. As he decides to make this journey back home, and I don't know how long, he's, again, this is a, a parable, it's a made-up story, but, but let's say he has uh, you know, a day's walk ahead of him that he has all of this time to be thinking, what's going to happen when I get there? What's my father going to say? What's going to happen? And I think that probably in his mind, the best case scenario would be that maybe my father will hire me. At least I can work for the family. Yeah, I'm no longer part of the family probably, but at least my father cares enough about me that he's going to allow me to be one of his servants. And so in that moment, the younger son repented. And again, we talked about this a little bit last week. But repentance is turning around and changing your direction. And he changed his direction and he headed back home so that he could begin to make things right. The Apostle Peter, in, in one of his sermons, said this about repentance. In Acts 3.19, he said, Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. And that's what this young son did. He began this process of turning around and heading back in the right direction, acknowledging that, that there's something that, that he messed up and that there's a need that he can't handle on his own. He acknowledged that he needed help. Now, I don't know how many of you are like me, but, but, but I struggle acknowledging that I need help. I, I don't really want help. I don't really, I, I want to do things on my own. I want to fix it. If something's broken, I want to fix it. If, if, if somebody in my family says, hey, I've got this problem, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm already, as they're explaining the problem, I'm already figuring out, trying to figure out ways to fix this problem. I like fixing. I like doing. I like taking care of things on my own. If there's a problem that I don't know how to fix, well, I believe that's why YouTube is there. So I go to YouTube and, and search. Somebody else has got a video on how to fix this problem. I want to take care of things on my own. Well, true repentance is, is throwing that off. Acknowledging that we need help and turning and running to God. For some of us, it's hard to imagine where you are turning and running to God and having God accept you. It's hard to imagine a, a loving father and his embrace. I mean, it's hard to imagine after all that we've done, after all that we've been through, after all of our sins and problems, after all the hurt that we've caused people, it's hard to imagine God accepting us. We feel like sometimes that going to Him for help isn't enough. I mean, we know that God would want to help us probably if God is loving. He would want to help us. But, but because I'm so far from Him, because I've done so much, then there has to be more, right? I mean, maybe if I can give more money at church. I mean, God will help me, but I want to help this process. I want to help God help me by, by giving more money. 
Or maybe if I just try to turn my life around, God will, God will help me if I, if I try to be better. If I try to stop doing what I'm doing and, and try to make these things right and I try to be a better person and live a better life and I try to you know, be kind to, the, to my neighbors and I help the old lady across the street and if I do some of these things, it's going to help God help me. If I attend church more regularly, if I, if I do all of these things, I'm going to help God help me. But what if? What if just turning to Him is enough? What if just acknowledging our need for God's help and turning and running to Him is enough? Are you ready to ask? Are you ready for the embrace of the Father? Because that's what will happen. If you acknowledge your need for help, if you acknowledge your, your struggles and your pain and, and all the mistakes and issues, and you turn to the Father, you will receive the embrace of of the Father. And again, I imagine the younger son being nervous. What's, what's he going to say? What's he going to do? What's going to happen? Is he going to run me off? Am I going to be even part of his family? And kind of it doesn't hurt to ask, I guess. But if he says no, I'm not going to be surprised. And I think sometimes we do the same thing in our journey back to God. When we've pushed God away, when we've rejected Him, when we've turned our back to Him, sometimes we, 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 we wonder those same things. Is God going to embrace me? Is He going to take me in? Or will He reject me? Is my sin too big? You know, I, I struggle with this and I keep doing this thing over and over and over. At what point is God going to say enough is enough? Well, let's look at verse 20 again and we'll read all of it this time. Talking about the young son, it says this, And he rose... And came to his father. But by, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. This would have been incredibly shocking to the people listening to Jesus tell this story. Jewish fathers were important. They were the, the, the foundation of the family. They led the family. They were the, the leaders in the family. And, and I don't know if you've recognized this, but important people don't run. Important people walk. And so the, the, the father here, they would have expected the father to, if he was going to embrace the son, to walk there, but he didn't. I imagine him uh, pulling up his garments Maybe even up to his knees, knees showing him, just as running as fast as he can to embrace his son. While he's still a long ways off. Another indication of a loving father is that he was looking for him and waiting for him. And when he saw him, he ran to him. And this ought to give us courage. This ought to strengthen our faith in God, knowing that, that, that God is waiting for you. No matter how far you've run or no matter how far you've gone, no matter what your problems are, no matter what your sins are, no matter what you've done in the past, God is waiting for you and longing for you to begin that journey back to Him. And when you do, He's going to come running. Those listening to, this, to Jesus tell this story, they would have marveled at Jesus' depiction and description of the Father. And they would have recognized immediately that, that Jesus is talking about God and this understanding of God waiting and longing to, to pick those up who are far from Him. It shows so much of God's character. And you know that Jesus is the author of this story, right? Jesus is telling this story. Jesus made up this story. And Jesus is able to tell us this about God's character because Jesus is God. And he knows God's character. And he's able to, to understand God's character. And he's able to understand what God would do because he knows. Because he is God in the flesh. I think about Jesus as he uh, alerted Peter, told Peter ahead of time, you're going to deny me when Jesus was about to be crucified. And Peter said, no way. And when they led Jesus in and he was arrested and Peter continually rejected Jesus. Three days later, or when the next time that Jesus saw Peter, immediately he welcomed him back. Because this is the character of God. So no matter how far you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what you feel like doing, or what you feel like you have done, or if you feel like God's far from you because you've pushed him away, God is waiting for you to come back. And he will embrace you. 
this is what in Scripture and this is what in the church is called grace. And it's this word we use a lot in church. If you've grown up going to church, you've probably heard that word a million times, grace. And as big and as powerful as you think that is, it's bigger and more powerful than you can imagine. Grace is huge. And as you think about lost people, uh, some of you, all of us, have been at one time lost. Some of you are no longer lost. Some of you in this room probably still are what we call, what the Bible calls and what God calls lost those who have not placed their faith and trust in Jesus. And when you think about lost people, it's this idea of, of, of taking care of that condition. God made a way to alleviate lostness in people. And that way is called grace. Even the younger son was willing to do anything that he could do to make this right. He was going to do anything. He was willing to be a servant. But the truth of the matter is there's nothing that he could have done on his own to take care of his situation. And the same is true with us. Grace, the, the grace of God is only available from God through the blood of Jesus. You can't get grace on your own. You can't take care of your lostness on your own. And the same is true for your family and your friends and your co-workers and your classmates and these people that you run into on a day-in and day-out basis who are lost. That's the, the, the beauty of grace. That there's no, there's no bar to jump over. There's no hill that we have to climb. And you know, you get to the top of that hill and then, okay, God's going to accept you because you worked really hard. No, there's no hoops to jump through. God already established the way for us to receive grace, and it was through the death and resurrection of Jesus. If we place our faith in Him, praise God, we're able to receive grace. Grace isn't about you or who you are. Grace isn't about you or what you've done. Grace is all about God and who He is and what He's already done through Jesus. So what do you think about when you think about grace? For those of you who have been in church your entire lives, it's, it's an easy thing to think about. You think about, um, you know, those catchy little things they taught you in Sunday school class. One of the things I remember, uh, some of you probably heard this, grace stands for, um, oh shoot, I forgot. <laughs> uh, um, shoot. Oh well, forget I said that. <laughs> When I, when I put this video together to put it on YouTube, I'm going to edit that part out. But what do you think about when you think about grace? I remember being taught about grace and what it is and, and all of these things. But what do you think about it? I mean, if you were honest and somebody asked you, what do you really think about grace? Would you say, I don't know, it's too lenient, right? A lot of people think that. I mean, how can, how can God show grace to somebody who's a murderer, for example? Maybe grace is too lenient. Or maybe you would say that, there's no way. I mean, I've done so much and there's no way that God would show grace to me. Usually this idea of what do you think about grace is kind of falls into three, three groups. And, and here they are. Group number one is I don't believe it. I don't believe it. There's no way. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I can understand it for some people, but I'm a, I'm a big sinner and there's no way grace is too big. And my sin is too big. My problem's too deep. I've hurt too many people. I mean, I've done some serious bad stuff. There's no way that grace can be what it is. I mean, if God's going to accept me and be loving and help me out, if I seek Him out, then I've got to do some stuff. I've got to be better, clean up my life, quit saying those things or doing those things, or then God can help me. And most people or a lot of people think like that. And usually people in this group, they'll compare their sin to the, to the way they see others. And usually they'll compare their worst the worst about themselves to what they see as the best in others. And so, so I'm this terrible sinner. And look, man, she is perfect. I mean, every post she puts on Facebook, she looks better and better each time. I mean, I mean it's like, you know, we compare ourselves to others and we say, no way, I'm too bad compared to everybody else. If the younger son had thought this way, I don't believe in grace, then, then he probably would never would have began his journey home. And people in this group usually have, have sinned in such a way that it's really devastatingly hurt people and it's usually the people that are closest to people in their family or their husband or their wife or or whatever and if you're in this group 
If you're in this group and you have, and, and you struggle, you, I mean, you want to believe in grace and you, and you, you kind of, you know, you do believe it, but you kind of don't too. If you're in this group, then, then you may know in your mind that God loves you, but it's just too hard to accept. So that's group number one. I don't believe it. Group number two is I expect it. I expect it. And unfortunately, this group is where most, I don't know if most, many of the Christians that I know fall into. God's going to forgive me. God will forgive me. I mean, I'm a pretty good person already, so I kind of deserve it, right? I mean, if anybody's going to get the grace of God, it's probably going to be me because I don't do a lot of really bad stuff. I mean, I sure I do. I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But if anybody's going to get grace, it's going to be me. Well, as Jesus was telling this story, there were some people standing around who would have believed that way. In, in uh, Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, we, we read exactly who Jesus was talking to. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And they probably would have been in the first group, not believing this kind of grace. Verse 2, and the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so as Jesus was telling this, this parable about, and these three parables about being lost, the, the Pharisees were grumbling that, that God, God would not accept that. I mean, you've got to get your life cleaned up first and these kind of things. The Pharisees definitely fell into this category of, I expect to receive grace. The Pharisees were good people who did good stuff. I mean, they weren't perfect, but they were pretty close to it. I mean, they were as close as you could get, and they knew it. If anybody was going to receive the grace of God, it was going to be Pharisees. Pharisee has come to mean someone who is self-righteous and hypocritical in our study when we, when, or in our time, in our society and culture. When we, when we say Pharisee, and we're not usually talking about somebody from the first century, we're talking about um, what it means to be self-righteous. He's so like a Pharisee. Or he's hypocritical, so he's like a Pharisee. Nobody thinks of themselves as Pharisees. Nobody says, you know what, I'm really kind of a Pharisee. <laughs> it's always somebody else, right? But this is how Christians are viewed in our society, largely in our society today. That we feel like and we act like we expect the grace of God. And you know what? We've earned that reputation. Because too often we live that way. I mean, you know, grace was a big deal at the beginning, but I'm pretty good now. I deserve it. Well, the younger son, as he was heading back home, he'd probably gone through a million different scenarios in his mind how his father was going to respond. I think except one. He didn't expect grace. He didn't expect to be embraced and kissed. And eventually, we'll read later, they threw a party for him. If you expect grace in your life, I mean, if you're living your life in such a way where you're like, well, this one sin's not that bad. I'm just going to keep doing that. I know God will forgive me. If you expect grace in your life, then you're thinking too highly of yourself. If you expect grace in your life, then you don't understand the significance of sin and the, and the devastating consequences it has on our relationship to God. God is willing to extend grace. He loves you so much. But grace is most easily identifiable and it's most I, I easily received when we acknowledge that we don't deserve it. When we acknowledge that God is giving it because He's good, not because we are. And sometimes I, I find myself there, right? I don't know how many of you do. Sometimes I find myself thinking, you know what? I'm pretty good after all. I mean, I have these issues, but God's going to give me grace. And when I do, when I find myself there, I miss out on the magnitude of grace. I miss out on, the, on, 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 on what it means to receive this embrace of God the Father. What it means the, to understand of my sins and the, the distance that that places between me and God. Group number three. I don't expect it, but I believe it. The only way to find yourself in this group is to, to believe Jesus. To trust in Jesus. To acknowledge that what Jesus said, that when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me, to acknowledge that that's right. To acknowledge that our sins don't deserve, because of our sins, I don't deserve the grace of God. 
but because I know God's good, He's going to give it. And when you acknowledge your regret, when you acknowledge your sin, and you turn in repentance and run to the Father for help, that's when you're in this group. When you acknowledge, I can't do it, I'm not good enough, but God is. You see, the Father already made a way for us to be helped. The Father extended grace to us through Jesus. And again, I, I said it before, Jesus knows the character of God because he, because he is God. And He's able to tell us about God's grace because He understands God's grace. And no one understands it like Jesus does. And he knows that God wants to give us grace because he desires a relationship with you. Imagine that. I mean, think about the things that you've done. Think about the things that you've done that in, those, in, in so doing, you have turned your back on God. You've rejected him. You've run off. But God loves you so much that he desires for you to turn and run to him. Christ died so that we could gain this grace. So that we could have this relationship to this loving Father. What greater joy, what greater joy is there than knowing that the Father is there waiting? Famous theologian and, and author uh, Augustine wrote this. He said, you have made for yourself, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. And I believe that's true we find rest in the loving embrace of a gracious Father. Are you ready to find your rest and your peace in the grace of God? Are you ready to, to turn and run to Him acknowledging that you need help? Are you ready to, to help those who you know who are, who are lost and need Him as well? Well, He's waiting. And He can't wait for you to come to Him. I'm going to say a prayer and, and, and we're going to sing a song. And during that time, we call it the invitation. It's an opportunity for you to think about what all of that means for you. And, and, and maybe some of you are in that condition that the Bible would call lost, where you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus. Then I would encourage you to seek me out or maybe one of our leaders or your friend or, or whoever and, and let them tell you about what that means to turn and follow Jesus, to run to God for, for grace. Maybe you're a uh, a Christian who's kind of in that, that category, that group where you say, you know, I've, I've been expecting God's grace and I, I wouldn't say it about myself, but I'm kind of a Pharisee. Then, then during this time, you can think about that and pray to God for help with that. Most of all, I pray that you would acknowledge the wonderful gift of the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for who you are and for your loving kindness and your goodness. Father, help us to remember this grace, which is the gospel, the good news, that we don't deserve it. None of us are good enough. We need help from you. And Father, in so acknowledging that, I pray that all of our thoughts and all of our, our, all of our day to day activities would, would not happen apart from a recognition that you are God and that you are holy and that we ought to chase after you and tell our friends and our family and co workers, classmates, whoever that they need to know your grace too. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.